my talk today is not about primates. It's about marine reptiles. And uh, I'm going to give you a short trip to an island north of uh, Norway uh, called Svalbard, or Spitsbergen, some of you might know. It's at 78 degrees north. It's the, like the northern tip of Greenland. Uh, and the archipelago is uh, actually, it's, uh, there's a Svalbard Treaty. So it means that all nations can work there and stay there. We work not far away from the main settlement called Longyearbyen in this high Arctic landscape. It's easy access now. There's flights every day, there's boats, there's everything. So I didn't discover these areas uh, we are digging in. It was found about 100 years ago, but nobody did anything about these fossils for 100 years. The first that found fossils in the area was some Swedes in 1914. But then there were some medical doctors that came to Svalbard, sponsored by the Rockefeller Foundation. And they overwintered one winter to see how the common flu spread through an isolated a mining population in the islands during one winter. It was one of the first epidemiological studies. These are Dr. Paul, Dr. Fries, and there's also a Dr. Maller that's not on the paper. I don't know why. Uh, but uh, three of them might be Americans. Certainly this one looks like one. Uh, <laughs> that's, that's probably a Norwegian uh, sailor. Uh, I don't know about that. Looks like a janitor, but uh, <laughs> might be an American too. But the, the, the important thing is that they went for a trip uh, just outside the city of Longyearbyen, or village, or small settlement uh, uh, at that time. And uh, they discovered a skeleton of a plesiosaur. And actually what they got here, this is the only picture that remains of this, but actually this is what we called a field jacket made out of plaster and burlap. So one of these people had the knowledge from North America, the only place where they were digging dinosaurs with this kind of uh, knowledge at that time. So one of them had to have some idea on how to dig dinosaurs to preserve this specimen. So it's quite uh, an enigma yet. So I tried to trace them back a little bit, some of these guys, but I couldn't find too much about them. But this fossil was given to the museum in, um, in Oslo in 1931, and it stayed there until a Swede described it in 1962. But nobody cared about this area. It's too remote, too much work to do any major digs. But um, uh, we started our digs in 2004. Actually, this area, of course, this is marine sediments that are now on land. So uh, they have been lifted up about 200 meters above sea level now. When they were uh, deposited, it was about 100 meters below sea level. But now we can actually camp on the Jurassic sea bottom and collect fossils. This area was high latitude even in the Jurassic. It was a cold water ecosystem also in the Jurassic. So we're trying to do several different kinds of studies here. It's now six field seasons. We're soon running into the seventh. Uh, we only stay up there for a couple of weeks each time, between two and three weeks, because of the weather conditions. We need the permafrost to melt into the mountains at least one meter, so it's easier to dig the first meter before you have to use jackhammers to get further into the mountainsides. And also we have, the, of course, the problem with snow. Uh, the snow can be there in July. Usually it melts in July and it starts to uh, cover the area again in the middle of August. So we have uh, no more than four weeks, really, to do this work. But in these four weeks, the slopes are really nice. There's nothing growing there, really nice. No plants, no nothing. It's like a polar desert. So you can walk on the shale, and when you find big lumps of things that do not look like black shale, they are, it's bones every time. So uh, then we dig them out. This is a typical day in excavation. That's me. Uh, <laughs> We have found this is a brain case of a huge pliosaur, and uh, we're mixing the plaster and encasing it. Our main fossil groups are marine reptiles. There are two main groups. They are, of course, air breathing. They are land living. They have land living ancestors. Uh, they are highly evolved to live in the marine environment at this time. This is 150 million years ago, same time as the long necked dinosaur ruled on Earth. This critters ruled in the ocean, and they're not dinosaurs. We find articulated skeletons. That means that you can see, like here, this is finger bones of a huge flipper from a plesiosaur. 
everything we find are, is articulated quite large specimens. Uh, there's no single bones found, really. If we find one bone, we find a skeleton. This is one we are just prepared now. It's an extremely, oh, you can see a model of it. Oh, it's swimming up here. This is the long-necked uh, plesiosaurs. This is the long neck. This is part of the front of the body. That's the shoulder girdles. This is the uh, ribs from the stomach. Here's a C uh, 3D scan we just uh, made last week of the extremely long neck and the front of the body of this animal. Unfortunately, it's missing the head, but still it's a very complete, nice specimen from a very crucial time in the evolution of plesiosaurs. So it's described now as part of a PhD that will be published next year. And I have several master students on the project. They finished their master student thesis uh, now uh, in June. Uh, so both Nilla and Lena, the two young women that finished their masters on flipper morphology and also on histology of the bones. It's really cool to see inside the bones, to see how they grow these animals. As we know, this is a cold water environment. We really like to see how reptiles survive as big marine mammal animals in uh, in uh, the cold water. And of course we got some pliosaurs. Uh, they are not as big as blue whales, but much cooler. They are like, <laughs> the heads are up to between two and three meters. That means almost uh, 10 feet. And the teeth are like large cucumbers. So very nice uh, animals. But what I'm finding, finding most interesting at the moment is really the uh, ichthyosaurs. We found a really, really very complete one last year. They look like fat overeaten dolphins, but they're not. They are uh, swimming in a different way, as you can see if you study that animation. And all the animations you see here is from this National Geographic documentary. This is the most remarkable hillside we got. You can see the camp. We actually camp on top of one specimen. These are ichthyosaurs and plesiosaurs. And they're all in one hillside. And for those of you that know a little bit about geology, you will see that this looks like a cream cake with the layers. That means that they are not in one layer, like they, it was an, a big uh, meteorite hitting or whatever and killing all the uh, animals. Actually, there's a big time difference between the lower ones and the upper ones. And that's so cool. And we're just starting to understand that now. Because what we have collected so far in the sixth, the sixth field season, we're going to collect six more skeletons this summer. So, uh, but now we have five partial and one complete ichthyosaurs, six partial and two almost complete plesiosaurs, and two fragmented pliosaurs. We're in the process of submitting all this, and it's four new species of plesiosaurs. Three to four new species of ichthyosaurs. I'm not splitting up the two uh, ichthyosaurs, but we have, uh, we have actually um, a lot of species of ichthyosaurs, uh, and we will wait with the description of some of them until, well, it takes two more years of gluing before we can start to uh, get the skeletons out. But, uh, but we got them in the lab now. We have more than 60 skeletons mapped in the area. We also worked on the high resolution stratigraphy of the whole locality. And uh, a cool thing to use then is, of course, ammonites. Because ammonites, they evolve very fast in the Mesozoic. So if you find good ammonites, you can actually divide the Mesozoic into half a million or one million year stratigraphic sections. And that's really good when you're talking about these old things. So we have mapped and we have also isotope stratigraphy of the whole thing and carbon isotopes and a lot of other things that I'm not going to talk about. But now we know that one centimeter of shale is about 1000 years. We got 55 meters of shale here. That means between five and six million years of time from, uh, from the first skeletons to the last. And that is really interesting for us paleontologists because uh, we can probably tell some stories from that. I will come back to that. When it comes to future work, well, the late Jurassic of Svalbard is really interesting because we have the highest concentration of Mesozoic marine reptiles in the world, probably. We, I think we have more than a thousand skeletons weathering out. And this is really what I would like to tell the story about in two or three years. Look at all the ichthyosaurs. And you know, from the beginning to the end of this section, it's five million years. So all this ichthyosaurs seems to be of the same genus. 
And then we can see macro evolution in one section. That's so cool. To end this, we have still a lot of work to do. It's a lot of unpublished material. We're going to publish the first big report on the expeditions next year as an expedition volume with description of a lot of the new species and the stratigraphy and all this. Hopefully, we will also be able to say something about an extinction that some paleontologists believe in and some paleontologists don't believe in. That's the border between the Jurassic and the Cretaceous because we got fossils just crossing that border in the Arctic now. So that was my talk. Thank you. Thank you.